expect you to do. Hallelujah. We give you all honor and glory. Hallelujah. joining in this morning. Welcome to Berea Church, our Sunday morning service, where our pastor is Bishop Renzi Abram, our assistant pastor, Michael Boyd, and our pastor, John Lee. We're thankful to be here on today, and we're going to go ahead and get started. So we're going to open up with prayer. If you are tuning in, please pray with us. Dear Lord, we just thank you Thank you, Father God, in the name of Jesus, you are the author and the finisher of our faith. We bless you on today, God. We just thank you for who you are. We thank you that you are a mighty God. You are powerful, hallelujah. You're an all-seeing God, all-knowing, and we appreciate you, God, hallelujah, for being in our lives, for opening up doors, for closing doors. Lord, for being in the midst, we thank you for your power, hallelujah. Right now, we ask that you bless the service, bless each and every one that is turning, tuning in on today. Lord, meet their needs, whatever it may be. Lord, you know, you see, and you understand. We thank you, Lord, in advance for doing all these things and more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. At this time, the next voice you'll hear is our pastor, John Lee. In Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Greetings from Korea Church this morning. We thank God for you. We pray that you've had a wonderful week. And we are going to get right into our study this morning. If you have your Bibles and uh, you're listening, or you can just listen in, uh, we'll be in Proverbs, the 14th chapter, and a few other uh, select scriptures this morning. Uh, today, as much as any moment, I think, in the recent past, we're dealing with a society that is uh, dealing with a lot of angry people, a lot of turmoil and strife and trouble uh, in the nation. So we want to just remember all those who are in prayer, who are uh, still shut in, those who don't have uh, employment right now, and just remember uh, the body in Christ as a whole. Uh, but we thank God for all that he's done. We thank him for you. We thank him uh, for the church at Berea. ask that you remember uh, Sister Betsy in prayer. She had an accident this week. All those members at Berea, that you reach out to her. Uh, of course, remember her in prayer uh, as she is dealing with that. But we thank God once again for all that he has done. We thank him for uh, all those who serve so diligently in the body. We thank God for those both young and old, Amen. white, black, red, and the like. Uh, we thank God for his word. Amen. David said, it is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Yes. Uh, we thank the Lord for his many, many blessings. Uh, Proverbs 14, 29. Proverbs 14, 29. And it reads as thusly, he that is slow, Numbers 20. 1 through 13, just for a little bit of context, uh, we want to talk a little bit this morning about the folly of anger or the futility of anger. Um, Numbers 20 reads, and I'm reading from the ESV, seems to be a little more plain for me. Uh, it reads, uh, 1 through 13 reads, and the people of Israel, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zen. In the first month, and the people stayed in Kadesh. Uh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. Uh, now there was no water for the congregation, and they assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And the people quarreled with Moses and said, 
I would that we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord. Why have you brought uh, the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness that we should die here, both we and our cattle? And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It, it is no place for grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. Then Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the entrance of the tent of the meeting and fell on their faces, praying. Uh, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the staff and assemble the congregation, and you and Aaron, your brother, and tell the rock before your eyes to yield its water. So you shall bring water out of the rock for them and gave them, give them drink to the congregation and their cattle. And Moses took the staff from the Lord as he commanded. Verse 10 reads, Then Moses and Aaron gathered and assembled, assembled assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels, uh, shall you bring, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his staff twice, and water came abruptly out of um, out of came out abundantly, and the congregation drank in their livestock. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. These are the waters of Meribah, where the people of Israel quarreled with the Lord. And through them he showed himself holy. Amen. The folly of anger. The folly of anger. If you are a Christian trying to live your Christian life, be careful following posts on social media uh, that seem to have some godly uh, reference, but are not really scripture. Amen. Uh, one of the issues that the Bible takes up clearly is anger. Now, I read a post recently that said, uh, anger is not a sin. Uh, the Bible says be angry, angry without sinning. Uh, it does not say anger is not a sin. Uh, all of our sins are not actions. Amen. Uh, all our sins are not actions. Jesus gets way past your action, way past my action, and goes right into my heart to diagnose a condition that he has called, in his word, sin. Uh, he says in his gospel, don't be angry with your brother. If you're angry with him, it turns to murder. So, so anger is the problem. Murder is the fruit. Anger is the seed. We want to uproot that seed is what he's saying. And he says that if you even look on a woman, you have sinned. So, so, so don't think that anger is something that God wants you to be as a Christian. He doesn't want us to be angry. And don't use that text as a reason to be angry. If you're an angry person, we're going to challenge you this morning and get to the seed of the problem this morning that we call anger. With the recent events with, in, in the media, uh, with the brother who was murdered uh, by the police officer, the whole nation seems to be in a frenzy. They all seem to be angry, and it seems like that some people have been more angry about this recent event than maybe even issues in their own life. But, but we're going to talk about the folly of anger, uh, the futility of anger to bring about ultimately the righteousness of God. When we look into the text today, uh, Moses, of course, is the leader of the Old Testament church. Somebody said Moses was the first mega church pastor. Uh, but really it's true. He was guiding hundreds of thousands, even millions of people at a point. They had came out of Egypt. Do you remember that in the book of, uh, uh, of Exodus? They came out of Egypt. They came out by a mighty hand. God gave them very strict instructions. Tell them to slay a lamb and, and put that blood on the doorpost. And that when the death angel came by, that the death angel would pass over every home that had that blood 
on that doorpost. And God was not concerned if you had dark skin or light skin, if you were young, if you were old, if you simply had faith enough to get that blood on the doorpost, then that death angel passed over you. And there's an arm that impetus and the power of that blood that they came out of Egypt. But that lamb was typical and it pointed toward the great lamb of God that would take away the sins of the world. And that would be Jesus Christ himself. And in it we see the great Christian doctrine, not of works, church, but of simple faith, what we call justification by faith. If anyone ever claims salvation any other way, you tell them it was the blood of Jesus that brought you out. Hallelujah. It wasn't your gift. No, 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 no. It wasn't your prophesying or your tongue talking or any other thing that you did. It was the blood of Jesus that brought them out. And it is the blood of Jesus uh, that brings us out. But as we look at the text, they were progressing toward the promised land. And as Christians, we are to progress in our faith, what we call sanctification. They are progressing, they're moving, they're being tried, and not everything goes well in your faith. If you're going to grow in faith this morning, you have to accept the fact that things are not always going to go right. Amen. Amen. Things are not always going to go right in your life. There are going to be times when, when the money is not abundant, when family's not coming along, when you're quarreling and arguing with folks, uh, but you have to maintain your posture in times when people do not have what they want, in times when people are constantly going against government and ruling authorities. We live in a day when, when people always are challenging government. They're challenging authorities in school. They challenge the mother and the father. The father can't discipline the child. The, the mother can't discipline the child. And, and, and so much fight against authority. Here we are. In the book of Numbers, and Brother Moses is dealing with the exact same thing. 2,100 years before the coming of the Lord. And nothing has changed in society. People argue against leadership. The Bible says that, that Moses and Aaron were getting broken down and worn down by the complaining and the arguing the fussing. Look. If you are leading a house, if you are leading something at work, if you are leading a school, if you are have a leadership role in anything, you're going to have to deal with the quarreling, and God shows us how he wants us to deal with it. Be obedient to his word. Moses did not do that. God told Moses to speak to the rock. And Moses, in his anger, smote the rock, and he, he, he gave the credit to himself. He said, we, are we, do we have to bring this water out of the rock? Moses didn't have any power. It was God. So he did not assign the glory to God, and he was not obedient. And because of that, Moses was not able to pass over into the promised land. Look, church, people, one mistake can shipwreck a whole life worth of good. Bible says, above all, guard your heart because out of it flows the issues of life. One mistake, you know. I think about Joe Paterno years ago that played for Penn State, the coach for Penn State. And, 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 and I don't know if it was one mistake, but it was definitely uh, one scandal. Overthrew his entire legacy there at Penn State, you know. And, and it came crushing down, and he died in infamy and shame. Over, over the fact that he had this thing looming over him. No doubt he had blessed young men, uh, but somewhere along the line there was a failure to act in ethics in, in, in his leadership role. So Brother Moses strikes the rock. God commands him, he shall not enter in, but it shows us what can happen when people are against you and fighting you, even in your own house. Amen, amen. We can get Upset, we can we can get to the point where we get angry. Well, we get angry. So, so where does that leave us? That leaves us with the word of God. What a blessing. It leaves us with his instruction. Proverbs says, He that is slow to wrath is of great understanding. Look, 
You can have a knowledge of the Bible. You, you can be a church goer and not have great understanding. Do you want to be a church goer or do you want to have great understanding? Uh, it ought to be the latter. The Bible says in all thy getting, that's wisdom, get understanding because stop piling and amassing all of this knowledge and this intelligence and you got all the data and you got the rows and the columns, but you don't understand nothing is a problem. What is the Bible saying? Those who are slow to get upset, not quick to tee off, uh, not quick to fire off, you know, not quick to pop off, not quick to lay into people, not quick to give your opinion, not quick to carry on quarrels and fights, but, but quick to try to bring them to an end. You know, I, I'm in a big family. We got a group text going, and, and some sometimes we have people who constantly keep the trouble going. You know, and, and it just is what it is. And we have to pray to make sure those people in your life, family or friend, it does not matter, do not drive you to the point where you are disobedient to God. Amen. Come on, somebody. Right. Where, where, where you're disobedient to God because the, the bad behavior of someone else. Were the children of Israel uh, uh, grateful? No. Did they complain? Yes. Had God provided for them? Yes. Were they acknowledging him as sovereign? No. He had provided everything for them. He brought them out with the mighty hand. Amen. He gave them manna from heaven. Yes. If they complained about that, he gave them meat. So much that they could take it. He was there for them. He was a pillar of a cloud by day and fire by night. All his right. mighty hand was with them. All he right. had came with them. He had delivered them. He had brought them out. They seen the hand of God. They seen but yet, they were complaining. And they were getting angry. All right, all right. And not only them, but the leaders. Uh, there are, within the framework of what we read, there are five basic questions I want you to ask yourself this morning as we work through this issue. The first issue question is this. Do I have an anger problem? And maybe some of us ought to ask other people because we're just not honest with ourselves. We wrap it up under the under the guise of I'm political. Oh yeah, yeah, I'm a politician. Or or or, or you know, or, or that was wrong. Or, or, or I'm out to exact judgment. But I want you to ask your question that is devoid of all those excuses. Do you have an anger problem? Number two is this. Does it matter? Because a lot of people will say, I have an anger problem, but it doesn't matter. That's my issue. So, so I want you to ask yourself, do I have an anger problem? Does it matter? Number three is this. What causes it? Well, what causes me to go there? Well, what causes me to snap? Okay? Do I have an anger problem? Does it matter? What causes it? Number four. What can I do about it when it's justified? Uh-oh. Now, now, we just said that, that, that anger is a sin. But yet, there's justifiable sin. There's justifiable anger. Okay? It, it, it doesn't make it right, but it's still going to happen. So we have to address it. Number five is this. What can I do to heal unrighteous anger? Uh, it is my hope that with this aspect of sanctification, really what we're dealing with is sanctification in your life. Uh, that conformity of bringing you to an image of Christ. Christ was not angry. He, he was the Prince of Peace. And, and I acknowledge his, his, his ordeal in the temple overthrowing and casting out the money changers. That doesn't overthrow the wealth of Scripture and the embodiment of God, which is peace. The outworking and, and the, the end, end of our faith is peace. Come on, somebody. Amen. Let me explain it. The Bible said, therefore, being justified by faith, we have what? Peace with God. Our faith was not given uh, to just put us in some obscure place with God. It was not for us to walk around with a badge saying, I accomplished something. You didn't accomplish anything. I didn't accomplish anything. You can always tell 
religious people because they view salvation as an accomplishment. But salvation was something that was uh, worked out through Jesus on the cross, Amen. through his sinless life. I was a partaker. You are partakers. Okay? But, but it is this work and the aspect of sanctification and ask them close to you uh, what they think about your anger. Uh, this is what I implore you today. Ask someone else close to you uh, an honest evaluation about your anger. Not someone who, who, who will tickle your fancy. But someone who will honestly give you an honest view of what your anger is. Looking at Moses, Moses was repeatedly provoked. And he doesn't lose his anger with Pharaoh, remember in Exodus 11? Or when Pharaoh constantly would not let God's people go. Uh, when Israelites are disobeying God in the matter of manna, remember that in Exodus 16? He doesn't lose it. Uh, he's angry, but, but his anger is justified, but he doesn't lose it. In Leviticus 10, he's angry with Aaron's sons, but he keeps his temper. Uh, God dealt with him, but, but Moses kept his temper. He, he was angry at the time, of course, rebellion. He's angry, but he keeps his self-control. Having been controlled for so long, uh, he loses it in Numbers 20. Uh, don't, a lot of us will be honest and we say, there's a snapping point for me. I snap, I'm a nice guy, I'm a nice lady, but everybody has their snapping point. Come on, somebody. That's true. You know, that is the truth. Uh, you can be a wonderful person, but my God, don't push me. Right. You know, uh, Moses has been pushed, he's been tried, and in Numbers 20, he has a meltdown. Mm. He is told to speak to the rock. He raises his arm, beats the rock, not once but twice. Pow, pow. He, he is a great example of a leader who thinks his anger is under control, right. but it's not. And it, it, I think it does as well to remind ourselves of Paul's letter to the Corinthians. It, it says this, he who thinks they stand, stand uh, take heed, or else to fall. You know, uh, how quickly people have a meltdown. You say, oh my God, I've never seen that side of that person. Yeah, yeah, they, they, they weren't guarding their own heart, and all of a sudden, bam, they snap. And you said, uh-oh, I seen another side of him. <laughs> I seen another side of her. Uh, she is a monster. Uh, he's, a, he's a devil. But it was always lying in there, but they were not taking heed of their own life and where their heart was, not their actions, because the anger was an outworking of their heart. So Moses is dealing with this thing. He's not taking heed. We all know the people who cannot control their emotions. If you're honest, it don't take you long. If I ask you right now, tell me someone you know who cannot control their emotions. They blow up and they tell everyone about all the injustices, you know. And, 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 but it's important to consider the words of the Apostle Paul to, to examine myself, myself. You know, uh, I recall asking someone to do something. Uh, they said something off color to me. And, and I said, okay. You know, and they, what they said was rude, Brother D. And, and, and I said, okay. And I smiled and I went away without no problem. All right, all right. But check this out. Later, as I thought about it, I was seated. In my mind, I was planning a, a staunch rebuke of this person. I, I didn't do anything or say anything. But if you could have seen what was in my heart, it was rated off. That well, is what it is. It, it, it was not good. Okay? Uh, anger is the, listen to this quote. Anger is the drawn sword, somebody pulled their sword up, of human emotion. It, it's from the first stirring of the irritation where the hand just moves toward the sword handle to the flaming fury of the unsheathed sword. So, so anger pulls that sword out, waves it above the head, and it's ready to strike. It, it is the strange subliminal emotion on the boundaries between perception and action. Anger. Anger is that thing between that thought and that action hanging out. And in between your thoughts and your action, there's one thing you do not want, church. 
Anger. Don't let anger be that bridge between what's going to happen and what I'm thinking. Okay? That's why Jesus said, don't be angry with your brother. Why? Because it leads to murder. He said, oh, not me. Yes, you. Yes, you. Yes, you. Yes, you. Yes, you. Yes, you, church folk. Yes, you, Sunday saint. Yes, you, shouting hallelujah. Anger. Don't let God be true. Let every man be a liar. Okay? And, and as our Lord Jesus indicated, it's the pathway to murder itself. So ask yourself, number one, do you have an anger problem? You know, have you gone home back to church? Anger or fume or, or breathing fire about something somebody said or did at the church. Mm. Do you have an anger problem? Mm. Have you ever lost your temper in church? In a church setting or said something you regret? Or in a tone of voice that you shouldn't have used? And ask yourself these questions. Have you ever found yourself daydreaming of how good it would be if such and such suddenly fell ill? Have you ever thought about how nice it would be if somebody you didn't like suddenly got sick and wasn't here anymore? Mm. Mm, now I like it, brother. Mm, yeah. Uh, or maybe how nice it would be if they just moved to Alaska <laughs> <laughs> or Hawaii. Oh, I heard Sister Sunset moved to Hawaii. Hallelujah. I, I mean, oh, Lord. <laughs> We're sure going to miss her. Uh, has your ministry ever had a nasty edge to it? Be honest. A, a hectoring tone or a manipulative urgency. I'm talking about your ministry. Mm -hmm. Amen. Your ministry. Sure. You're doing God's service. Has it ever had a nasty edge to it? If you're honest, people, you'll say yes, 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 and yes. Mm -hmm. Has your frustration ever spilled over from church into your marriage or your home so that you snap on a family member? And have you ever went to work and came home mad and laid into somebody at home? Do you have an anger problem? Okay. If the answer to those questions is no, then we can shut it down and I can get on out of here this morning. We can get on out of here. But if we're honest, the answer to those questions is yes. We, we have an anger problem, okay? Uh, the letter killeth that comes along to slay us, and now we're going to look for Jesus here to make us alive, okay? Mm -hmm. Not quite yet, but we're going to get there. Has, has it, so, the, so the answer, obviously, to one is yes. Number two is this. Does it matter? Well, of course it matters, but, but why does it matter, okay? When Moses loses his temper, he didn't say Lord, I was tired and I lost it. Uh, these people have been winding me up for years, man. Uh, you can hardly blame me, Lord. I mean, uh, wouldn't you do the same thing? That's not what he says. Uh, but the Lord says, this is so serious, Moses, that you cannot enter into the promised land. Look, people, the promised land is a type of heaven. And you are so sure you're headed to heaven. And you are angry and disobedient? How? How? Moses is the lawgiver. He's been faithful. The Bible said he was, no one was greater than Moses, yet he is cut off from the land because of an act of disobedience because our acts reveal the condition of your heart. Yes. You are not angry uh, obliviously. You got heart issues, and God got to get to the root of your problem. Amen. Here are three ways a pastor's anger can harm a church. I'm preaching to myself this morning. Just as a hot-tempered king or president can generate an atmosphere of fear in a church, and my God, don't we have an atmosphere in this country now? For example, if someone says, why don't you go ask the pastor? They might say, well, I'm afraid because he might get upset. Uh, church becomes a place of law rather than grace. The people were behaving badly. They were quarreling. Uh, look at Psalms 106 and, and, and 32 and 33, uh, if you got time. 
But astonishingly, God does not tell Moses to rebuke him. He's working through people in mercy and grace. You know, mercy and grace commingled in all God does with man. And many of us cannot have a basic normal relationship because we're so angry and quick to bring down that hatchet on everybody. Bang out, everybody but us. Bang out. That we can't have a normal relationship, yet God has brought us into fellowship with him and Jesus and, and shed his blood for our sin and gave us peace with him, promised us heaven and heavenly places, all on the strength of grace and mercy. But, but I can't give it to my brother and sister. Anger in the church will damage homes. You know as well as I do that there is no abuse at home and, and there, uh, and pastors and ministers, and it's there. And if it is not addressed, it, it will be harmful. The anger will be harmful to the pastor. If it's not uprooted, it, it will steal the man or the woman's uh, joy. Okay, what does it cause? Uh, number one, external. With the people, Moses was upset with the children of Israel. Okay? That's number one. Uh, leaders get upset, quarreling, quarreling, arguing, arguing, complaining, upset leadership. Number two, shortage of money was one of the problems. Uh, a lack of money can bring out fussing and fighting. Uh, you know, do we got enough? We got 107 and 25 cents. The bill is 108.80. You know, uh, let's start fussing and fighting about money in the house. Uh, she went and she bought an extra death, uh, dress this week, Sister Lee, and, and we don't have that much money. But 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 money is a problem and makes people angry. Uh -huh. You know, uh, people get killed every day for money. Amen. Uh, the number one uh, reason for murder uh, from the beginning of time till today is love and money. Amen. You know, you can trace most murders back to those two things, love and money. Okay, so they didn't have money. They're upset. Number three, they were unwilling to help. You know, if you're a part of a church ministry, the pastor needs your help. The church needs your help. Uh, he ain't not calling you and ministering to you uh, for nothing. We need your help. We need your physical help. We need your blessings. We need your giving but for the work of the ministry. Okay? Amen. Fellow leaders don't see the vision for your ministry. Anger. Moses had been given a clear set of, of an edict from God of what the children should be doing. A lot of times in ministry, not having people uh, agree or line up or with the overall vision will cause anger. Amen. All right? Don't, don't let that, pastors, don't let that throw you off. You pray for them, God will handle it. Okay? He'll lead you in the right way. Number five, it is a fear of failure or overwork. You know, a lot of times as a father or, or keeper of a home, it, it can feel like no one else is helping me. I got to cut the grass. I got to pay the bills. I got to do the dishes. I got to guard the house. Then I got to go outside here and do everything else. Not having the, the, the support a lot of times will, will lead to anger. But you have to trust God that he's going to bless you. Okay? A fear of failure. Number six, unfair criticism or lie. Have you ever been criticized as a leader? Have you ever been criticized as a person? Uh, your honest effort uh, isn't enough. People criticize your honest, good, godly, well-sent effort. What do they say? Uh, what's that crazy saying they say? Uh, uh, Good, uh, no good deed goes unpunished. Oh, right. that, 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 that's not true. That, that's a negative outlook on life, you know. But, but what the person is saying, every time I try to help somebody, I always get hit. I always get stuck. I always get hung out to dry, you know. Uh, nobody knows the trouble I've seen, but that's not true, okay. Unfair criticism or lies can bring about anger. You know, but a lot of times if someone is lying on you, just be patient. The Lord will fight your battles. I promise you. If you do not get angry, if you do not deal with people unrighteous, 
Honestly, God will expose every liar in your life. Yeah. He will uproot every enemy that you have. You. And just like David said, a thousand shall fall by thy side. Ten thousand shall fall at thy right side. If you do your part as a Christian and you uphold your faith and your strength and your integrity, God will fight your battles. Yeah. He is a battle fighting God. The Bible calls him the Lord of hosts. That, that's the Lord of the army of the Lord. Yeah, you remember Joshua. The Bible said in the Old Testament that he ran upon the, 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 the Christ, Christophany of Jesus Christ and, and the army of the host of the Lord. And he asked him, whose side are you on? How are you going to ask God whose side are you on? <laughs> but God told him, I ain't on nobody's side. I'm the boss. He said, I'm the host. I'm running this thing. You get behind me. A lot of times we, we try to get in front of God. You can't get in front of the host, can you? He's the captain of the army. He's, he's ordering my steps. You know, he's ordering my steps. But unfair criticism. Number seven, this is a good one. This is an honest one. You'll like this one. Sexual frustrations. Sexual frustrations can bring about anger. You know, if you're not dealing with, with, with your sexuality in some form, you know, then it can bring back anger. Uh, wives, uh, 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 make yourselves available to your husband's husbands. You are not your own, but, but you belong to your wife. You know, if she ain't giving it up like she's supposed to, he ain't giving it up like he's supposed to. Sometimes bad stuff is going wrong. Sometimes he's praying and fasting. But don't let it get you to the point where unrighteous anger is coming out. Amen. You know, some people honestly, from a, 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 a godly perspective, are upset and angry at you because they're not getting what they're supposed to be getting from their spouse. Oh, uh, well, I'm a preacher now. That's right. <laughs> because they're not getting what they're supposed to be getting. But that's not a reason for you to be angry. Amen. You, you have to diagnose the problem. What's going on here? He's supposed to be uh, making sure he's giving proper attention to his wife. She's supposed to be giving proper attention to her husband. And if you ain't married and you're frustrated, start praying for her husband and start looking. And all this foolishness about a woman can't talk to a man, that's crazy. You might die without a man. You better start talking. You know, there's a church that says, open up your mouth and say something. Come on, somebody. Open your mouth and say something. Say that at home. Open up your mouth and say something. Sexual frustration. Number eight, people who have brought you along on their anger trip. I love this one. People who have brought you along on trip anger. Remember in Ephesus in Acts 19, Paul said they didn't know why they were there. I love this. This, this is classic Facebook foolishness. I, listen to this. Listen to this. This is Bible. You can't make this stuff up. He said, they didn't know why they were there. <laughs> I don't know why I'm here, but I'm angry. Uh, now, now, there is a wealth in this. Uh, sometimes we get off on an anger trip, and if someone were to actually ask us why we were mad, we would be quite embarrassed. Well, we couldn't even tell them why. Paul said there was this thing going on in Acts 19, and he said, we didn't even know why we were there. And a lot of times, I'll ask people, I said, so you're upset about the thing? And I said, well, you know, give me some background on it. What happened? They said, well, I don't know, but I heard, and, and I heard that this happened, and, and the guy did this, and he, I said, are you sure? I said, no, but I heard it. Where'd you get it from? Oh, I got it off of Zubaloo.do. I said, you did? Hmm. I said, you don't even know if this stuff is true? Hmm. The Bible said they didn't even know why they were there. My God. And they were upset and rioting. Number 10, and this is the last one, when Mary of Bethany anoints Jesus for his burial. Check this out. In John 12, Judas got mad about her worshiping God. Mm. Don't get mad about me worshiping God. And I've seen people at the Colts game jump out of the stand and break a leg. I've seen in a baseball game jump two roll over onto the head trying to catch a baseball. But I can't give God no praise. The devil is a liar. The Bible says that Judas got mad because she was, he basically said in, in common parlance, he would basically be saying stupid.
stupid woman, you're wasting the ointment. The other Gospels tell us that the disciples were generally irritated, not just Judas. Uh, the, the liberals say it's a contradiction, but they don't understand how human affairs work. But, but it's a chain reaction, you see. Judas says silly women, and it echoes down the line until Jesus interrupts it. Look what he said, silly man. Silly man. Uh, that's a paraphrase, of course. Uh, but I think you get the point. So, so it's a good question to ask yourself. Is what someone else said fueling my anger? I'm very careful about who I let into my space. I don't fool too many folks. Because I, I got one person in my family every morning, they send me negative news. Oh, mm -hmm. I said, hey, can you send me something nice? And every morning. Oh, some, uh, such and such shot on the east side. Oh, such and such did this. I said, hey, I, I don't want to hear all that. <laughs> uh, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever lovely, come on, Philippians. Yeah. Think on these things. I don't need to hear all the negative news to know bad stuff's going on. I don't want to hear it. Above all, church, do what? Guard your heart because out of it flows the issues of life. Don't let these things come into your space. And I'm not talking about being oblivious to the news. I'm talking about an honest and earnest guarding of your heart and letting people who are always negative, always mad, always upset, looking for you to join the riot in Acts 19, and you ain't got no idea why I'm supposed to be mad, don't do that. Anger affects the heart. Many of us are upset today because we want to be in control. This is the new political thing. Democrats are mad and Republicans because they want to be in control. Not necessarily because they want to help, they don't want to be in control. Republicans are mad at Democrats, not because they love everybody, because they want to be in control. It's a control issue. A control issue. And, and our anger reveals our heart. Remember Herod? He, he was angry when he feared another king would be born. What did he do? He, he started killing babies, man. You know, I, I'm not with killing babies. Amen. I got one amen. I know there's still some in the body that, that got some good sense. Amen. Amen. Saul was angry when he feared David would be king. He was king himself. Yet he was insecure about a future king. And there's pastors today who are insecure uh, uh, about threats in church of people who are gifted. Won't let nobody else preach. Won't let nobody else teach. Won't let nobody else sing. That's true. You know? And there's a whole lot of gifted people in the body of Christ. As a matter of fact, the Bible says everybody's gifted. That's right. Not just one person. That's right. And then that don't mean your pastor's going to let you get up this week because you ain't got that gift. You, you're right where you need to be. But, but look, what I'm trying to say is this. Don't be threatened by other gifted people. That's right. we, we all are gifted in different ways. What a blessing. It's the mark of a secure pastor to be surrounded by people who are more gifted than himself. Not, not equally gifted, more gifted. You know, the, the most gifted person isn't always the leader. <laughs> no way. That's right. No way. Amen. The most gifted person often is the one who is supporting everyone, who, who can give something to everybody. You get that through your head this morning? That the most gifted person rarely is the leader. And that goes for myself. You know, let he his greatest in the kingdom do what? Serve. Okay? But the mark of a great pastor and a leader is to surround, surround yourself with people who are more gifted than you, better looking than you, wiser than you, know more scripture than you, got more money than you. Humble yourself. To make strong appointments and not feel threatened by people. This is the marks of a good pastor. Make strong appointments and not feel threatened. Okay, And, and not to overact to criticism. If you're going to be a leader, Moses... He wasn't able to handle the criticism, you know, uh, to be in control. What is going on in my heart? Uh, so the question, question to find the cause to ask ourselves is, what does this anger reveal about my heart? So when I get angry, this is the question. What does this anger that I'm feeling show about me? Because a lot of times it shows we're jealous. 
it often shows we're jealous that someone else got something that we thought we should have. A husband, a wife, a job, a position in the church, all of these things, money, houses, cars. This is what this is this is what is revealing. When, when God says to Jonah, he says, Are you right to be angry? Or he says to Cain in Genesis 4, after he, he killed his brother, he said, Why are you angry? Uh, the answer comes back that I am angry because something I treasure is being taken from me. And then God asked this question. Are you right to treasure it? Oh, oh, hold up, hold up. Something I treasure is being taken. But God asked, do you have a right to treasure it? Okay, and, and that is the key diagnostic question of the whole deal with anger. If she is sleeping around on me, I have a right to be upset here. Okay? If he's sleeping around, you have a right to be angry. But what we find out is that a lot of times, we don't have no right to be angry. That's right. If you read through the Bible, apart from the anger of the Lord Jesus, you will find only about four instances in the whole Bible, 66 books, where anger is actually justified. Most biblical pictures of anger are like a chamber of horrors. Mm -hmm. so, so I want to ask two questions. My anger is justified. What am I going to do about it? Okay? Uh, Psalms 119. Hot indignation ceases me because of the wicked who forsake your law. Uh, that seems to be justified. You know, uh, people who are wicked and wrong, and, and, and God is not happy with them. Okay? So what do I do? Here's the instruction. All good teaching has instructions. So don't forget the instructions. The rest of it was just, you know, they, we, in writing, it would be called a dribble or fluff. But I wouldn't necessarily call it fluff. But here is the brass tack. Four pointers. Number one, be deeply suspicious of myself. John the Baptist was angry over religious hypocrites. Uh, if we are sure we are right to have, we have a right, we have to be very careful because every uh, self-righteous anger closes the door to repentance. Anger closes the door to repentance. I can, I've had people that I minister to right now who have closed up the door to repentance because they will not accept the fact that they have no right to be angry. And when you can't acknowledge the fact that you are angry, it shuts the door to repentance. And when you cut the door, shut the door to repentance, you ultimately cut the door or shut the door to spiritual growth. You shut the door to being having normal working relationships. Amen. Amen. All of this is the result of anger. Okay? So, so be deeply suspicious, not of your brother. Okay, do a deep search and repent. Number two, leave room for the anger uh, of the wrath of God. Uh, remember Romans 12 and 19. Somebody help me with it. I don't have it up. Romans 12 and 19. Look, leave room for the anger uh, and the wrath of God. I, I, we've already talked about the fact that God... Um, will come to your side and deal with people who have done you wrong. He will expose liars. He will expose those who... He fights for his people. That's what I'm trying to say. Anybody got it out there? Romans 12, 12 and 19. Dearly beloved. Dearly beloved. Avenge Keep not yourselves. Avenge not yourselves. But rather give place unto wrath. But rather give place unto wrath. For it is written. For it is written. Vengeance is, Vengeance is mine, saith who? I will repay. Saith the Lord, I will repay. Amen. Look, that you, you can tell one of your partners, you say, hey man, uh, Ronnie did me wrong, man. He'll say, I'm going to get him. He, he may get him, he may not. God is not like that. He said, I will repay them. Amen. Uh, the Bible says, here's an old a Christian doctrine rooted in the Old Testament. God told Abraham, I'll bless those who bless you. I'll curse those that curse you. And one of the 
things I want to tell people right away when I know that they're mistreating me. I say, be careful. Be careful. Be, because you're going to be cursed if you're not careful. God will bless you for blessing me, but he will curse you for cursing me. And if you are walking in the favor and obedience to God, if you are doing what he has asked you to do, if your faith is in him, every mouth that rises against you, he'll shut. And every arm that rises against you, he'll shut them down. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Amen. You know, Peter said he's not slow as men count slowness. I promise he will exact judgment. You look up and that person might not even be living no more. Amen. I pray for my enemies. But let me tell you what. God said vengeance is mine. Uh, you know, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Mm -hmm. They're not carnal. They're, they're not ironed out on Facebook. You know, they're not ironed out on social media. But, but Bob says they're mighty through God. So they're pulling down a stronghold. Prayer, faith, and obedience. Leave room for God to do his work. You know, sometimes two guys are fighting it, and the guy that needs to be up front is the bigger fellow. And the little guy's up front. Will you step out the way and let the one who can do the fight do the fight? And stop acting like a nut? A little nut. All right? Number three, know your limitations. Part of the reason we get upset at pastors and Christians, we tend to think that Changing people is your responsibility or my responsibility. I can't change nobody. You can't change nobody. And if God don't change it, they'll never change. Uh, they don't need uh, uh, lazy rebels that need to be yelled at and uh, calling them names. And, uh, uh, you know, we become stressed out in uh, what we call a law-led affair, whereby we just throw scriptures to people, you know. Every time we get coming to the church, you come another scripture. You know, don't beat me up the head with the Bible. Uh, you can't change nobody. The, the word of the Bible cannot change them. Okay? The, the, the actual scriptures cannot. It has to be the indwelling of Jesus to change a person. Yes. The Bible says the letter kills, but the spirit makes alive. All the law does will let me know I have been a liar. I have been a cheater. I have been an adulterer. I have been a murderer. I have been a homosexual. I've been all these things. It takes the indwelling power of Jesus to change a person. I can't change them. You have to know your limitations. That's number three. To deal with your anger, you can't change nobody. You can't make them stop voting Republican. You can't make them stop voting Democrat. You can't do nothing. Know your limitations. But if we accept that we don't have power, uh, you know, to want what we ought to want, we will accept that that while they need what they need is not rebuke or shouting, but, but a fresh course of the gospel of grace. When people are angry with other people all the time, they haven't seen grace in their own life. Honey, you need Jesus. You mad at everybody else? You need repentance. You need mercy. A lot of times we don't see the need for our own repentance. Uh, the rock in Numbers represented Christ. Remember, God told Moses, you did not believe in, he, not the rock. He said, you did not believe in me. It wasn't the rock. It's not the external things that are the problem. It's not that uh, you don't trust government. You don't trust politics. You don't trust your sister. You didn't trust Jesus. That's trouble. That's trouble. The last one is this. Meditate on the anger of Jesus. Think about this. I'm going to give you some scriptures. Okay? I'll, let me recap. What do we do? Be deeply suspicious of yourself. Number two, leave room for God to, to take care of the people that are messing with you. Number three, know your limitations. And number four, meditate on the anger of Jesus. Okay? Uh, James 1, 13 and 5. Uh, don't say God is testing me. A lot of people say, oh, he's trying me now because I'm putting the snack. Uh, but the Bible says God does not tempt anybody. It is not in his business to tempt you. Okay? Uh, God is not trying to play with your mind. It's not his fault. That's James 13, 15. 13 and 15. James 1 and 19 and 20. That whole, whole chapter is good on anger. 
James 19 and 20 says, Soak yourself in the gospel. Emerge yourself in God's word. Meditate on his goodness. Remember his promises. And declare his word powerful in your life. James 1 and 5 says this. Pray for wisdom to speak with great care. Look, some of us, are my, our mouths are like, uh, you know, it's just a, a mess. I'm talking about Christian folks. Uh, it, it's just an absolute mess. Cussing, swearing, going on, snapping on people. Won't shut up. No no kindness. Can't keep that thing shut. And when it is, it's like the old uh, uh, Jews of John the Baptist's day. It's an open grave. Come on, man. Here it is. Pray for wisdom to speak with great care. When God is working through a human mouth, that person is as wise and as grand and as ecclesiastical and as intelligent and as revelatory as any person, any philosopher, any PhD. He is as wise as anyone when he prays for the wisdom of God to speak with care. Uh, wisdom is not knowing something. You can know stuff and not have any wisdom. You can know how to do math and calculus and know how to put together sentences and not have wisdom. You can even know the Bible and not have wisdom. Pray for wisdom. Chapter 3 and 13. 5, James 5 and 7. We're working all through James here. Here's the last one. Wait for the return of the Lord. God is coming back. Okay? God is coming back. The Lord is coming back. The Lord is coming back. Hallelujah. The Lord is coming back. The Lord is coming back. He's coming back to deal with everyone who thought that they got away with murder. You know, that's part of my peace, brother. It is that one day God is going to write everything. That I don't need to go get a 45 Glock to take care of all my problems. That I don't need a sword. I don't need to have an unsheathed. That one day God is going to right every wrong. What did Isaiah say? And every mountain shall be made low. Every valley shall be exalted. The crooked places shall be made straight. The, the rough places shall be made smooth. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And we'll all see it together. The day is coming when, when Jesus Christ himself is going to make right every wrong. Amen. You know, every wrong, every possible wrong, everything that was not right, he is going to make it right. You know? And, and that's our that's our ultimate peace. We we have peace in this life. We have power in this life. But the, the issue today, anger. Be honest about your anger, you know? Yeah. Be honest about your anger. We're living in a day and time that you can't even tell people who you're going to vote for Amen. without them getting mad. It, it, it's my prerogative. I vote for whoever I want to vote for. Amen. How am I going to be mad at you because you want to vote different than me? Amen. Mad. I, I'm not talking about disagreeing. Mad. Angry. Don't, don't vote for him. Hey, man. Hey, hey. Time out. <laughs> that, that's my business. And that's your business, you know. And you can't do anything. We're so judgmental, you know. But God does not want you to be angry. Get that thought out of your head. God knows, you know, you have not yet striven against sin. That's what the book of Hebrews said. You have not yet strived against sin unto death. You haven't paid for sin. You got your own sin. And are you that mad about something? If you won't be mad at somebody, be mad at yourself. You know, because you have not paid the price for sin, but Jesus did. He laid down his life. He gave the ultimate price. Don't be angry. You know, don't be angry. Don't be angry. Thanks. The folly of anger. The futility and the foolishness of being angry. Let me just give some practice. Been doing something and got angry and, and then you forgot what you was doing. How many times have you been driving and all of a sudden you're on that phone and you're going off and you missed your exit? <laughs> Anger throws you off of focus. <laughs> you, you can't even focus because you're so mad. You know, you, you can't do nothing. 
That, that's why when they're playing sports, they get in underneath their skin, D, they, they'll give them an elbow. Bam! Because the guy's mad, he can't even hit, he can't shoot no more. Right. He's mad, and, and we've taken the best player on the team, and he's no longer any good to well, I, I don't get mad too often. I don't try to get angry too often. Be, because it does not produce. Look look at you. Here you go, know, people who say anger. God bless you. Um, we're looking at the 21st of June for coming back to church. Berea, 21. We're here recording until then. So if you want to come in the morning, then just sit in. You can wear your mask or not. or That's your prerogative. But we're asking that we try to keep a, a normal distance from people uh, during this time still. But uh, June 21st, that's Sunday. We're expecting to be back here in fellowship with us and to worship the Lord. Amen. June 21st, put that on your calendars. All those who wish to come and worship with us. Um, this week, uh, we're going to finish up some lightweight painting and cleaning at the church. So uh, offer your services if you would. We can use you. Uh, we thank God for each and every one of you. We thank him for the word. We're going to end the word in prayer. And we're going to dismiss. Father God, we thank you today for your word, lamp unto our feet, and a light unto our path. We thank you for each and every brother that we are able to work with and labor with. We thank you for our mothers and our fathers and our sisters and our brothers. Above all, we thank you, Lord, for your son, Jesus Christ, died for our sins. We just bless you now. We thank you. We ask you to strengthen us. We know someone today needs a touch. We, someone today needs a move. And I pray right now that person prays with me and we touch in spirit this morning that God will deliver what you need today, that you might have a testimony in the days to come, that God moved on your behalf, that you did not have to act, that you did not have to get angry, but that God moved it. He took care of your problems. And we know and understand, Lord, that it is your will and desire to show yourself strong in our lives. So we yield to your power. We yield to your word. We come as obedient, glad, and grateful servants. In Jesus' name, we touch heaven and earth with this prayer. We mix it with faith. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. We love you. God bless you. Thank you, Lady Elder Lee, for helping. God bless you, Brother Irby, for hanging out. We'll see you next week. We'll see you Wednesday night for Bible study. Love you. God bless you.